Hi, I'm Katie and this is episode 42 of Ornamentations, which will have some of my usual. I've got progress on my whips. I have a new finish to share with you as well as some truly fabulous new silk colors that I'm so excited about. But we'll also be talking about success and failure. What defines each in your stitching and what do you hope to achieve? with it, which is the theme for today, because I will also be showing you a major, major finish that predates my floss tube that I haven't shown here before and that you can rate as either a success or a failure or possibly both, depending on how you look at it. It is the biggest piece of stump work I have produced to date. So if you've been enjoying the looks at the Britomart casket, you should really, really like seeing this. I also have the four giveaway winners from the last episode to share, so make sure you stay tuned to that to see if you've won. First news item for today, though, is that the third lesson of the Elizabethan Valentine is up tomorrow, March 2nd, so check your email for the announcement of the lesson and a link. The third lesson covers the working of the silver metal thread filling on the heart, which I know is something that many of you have really been looking forward to. I've worked really hard on this lesson, so I hope you'll enjoy it and enjoy oh, what makes the Elizabethan Valentine such a special piece. But first thing I have for today is some whip progress. So I believe it was two episodes ago I showed you where I was on Brenda Gervais pattern Santa Stops Here which is a recent release and this will be the Christmas in July floss tube kit so the conversion is not shared it's exclusive to the kit which will be dropping the first week of July and this is my progress I am almost done with the house isn't that amazing? So the blank spot up there in the middle is where the wreath is going to go. As you can see, due to my noted hatred of sitting, stitching letters, I have left out the candy house sign. I wanted this to be just any house where Santa could visit and bring presents to the kids. I loved working the stone, so my idea was to move the wreath down and kind of center it right here and then that would evenly fill in the house. However, I am still, as you can see, waffling on the green. So I've left that blank until I do the wreath and then I will fill in the stone around it. But that house is an absolute stunner. I could not be more pleased and the way it looks on the Himalayan fog is just amazing. So these are my silks so far, kept in my Katie thread folio from Lou and Sue. The conversion is turning out beautifully. I have one brown left to pick and a green, and then I can hopefully power through to finish because I really need to get working on that border in particular. So I hope to have some mega progress on Santa Stops here to show you next time. And then the other stitch I have is actually a finish. I did FFO Tulip Festival, which will be the spring floss tube kit, and we'll look clo more closely at my finish and the details of the kit a little closer to the time. I tentatively have that launching on April 11th, but the materials aren't all in yet, so I will confirm that date closer to the time. It's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful project that I love stitching and I hope you will too. But my finish for today is a project that you haven't seen before because I started this oh, months ago and then it had to go on timeout. I put it under something on my desk and then discovered it last week. I had completely forgotten about it. I had never shown it on my floss tube. And that's my version of Plum Street Samplers Summer Hill. We had before the cold snap and the course, we've had snow in this section of California, which never happens. It's been crazy. But before that, we were having some really beautiful weather. I was feeling the whole spring flowers vibe. So I found and decided to finish my version of Summer Hill, which is 
quite different from the model. So what I really loved about this were these wonderful flowers and then the, well, what I would call quilt star detailing at the top. The more prim figure I felt like I could live without. So I revised this to be all focused on flowers and quilt stars. And I don't think my conversion was entirely successful, but you can tell me what you think. So I changed the center to add another flower. The bottom is worked pretty much exactly, and I will be sharing the conversion for this one in the description, so check there if you're interested. This is on Legacy Linen 38 Count Irish Coffee, which just is gorgeous with these greens, with that vibrant yellow. And then where I got stuck was on the quilt stars. So I originally started out with the red, but that was overpowering the flowers. And then I thought, well, what about a blue? And I tried dark blue, medium blue, light blue, all the blues I had, and those weren't doing it either because it works here because you've got the person in the center to anchor it and to bring these two halves of the pattern together. Without that, it looked like half half, right? They weren't connected and not speaking to each other. It was not a good thing. So then I finally settled on off-white. I thought I would fill in the center here with a yellow, but after so much experimentation, I can't tell you how many times I've stitched this pattern with all the stuff I've frogged, the colors I tried and didn't like, I could not find the right shade. So if you'd like to take up the challenge, please do and share your finish. See if you can actually bring the top home on this pattern because I don't think I did. This isn't as good as it could be, but it is still really pretty because look at those. And then I did my beaded loop dudging with um, two millimeter round crystals, the color is Crystal Moonlight, and I'll link my tutorial in the description, and I will share the conversion. These are the threads. It doesn't take very many, and one of these you could leave out. So I used creme only in one place, which was the surrounds on the flowers, where it wasn't actually touching Irish coffee. This was one of my first times, as I said, this is old, stitching with whites and off whites on Irish coffee. And when I moved up to the stars, I found that crumb didn't really play as well with Irish coffee as I liked. So I used two others instead. They may look different, but as you can see, there's a brighter off white for the small stars highlighting here and then in here. And then these bigger elements are worked in the darkest off white here. These are all actually really great silks for stash. So we've got two good greens, lovely yellow here, and then three off whites. So crumb, FO2, and 2541. You could actually stitch this with just FO2 and 2541 and leave out the crumb. But if you want a full selection of off whites to round off your silk stash, these are three great ones. So I'll put the conversion in the description. And then tell me what you think of Summer Hill. Would, what would you have done differently if you were going to stitch it this way with the flower and without the person? How would you have resolved the problem of the quilt stars at the top? So I still think this will look great in a summer or spring display. Having removed the person in the flag means this can go with spring, this can go with summer. I still really like it. I just feel like I didn't quite get it that extra mile that would have just made it a mm, stunner piece. However, I was excited to get it finished because I think it has a chart friend that might make for a great display. So I'm thinking about starting this fairly soon. Tell me what you think. And I think the chart friend is for this is Plum Street Samplers, This Happy Morning, which features some similar elements I think these would go beautifully together. This Happy Morning is a much bigger stitch. It's 254 wide by 244 high. So this will be like the little baby bear companion. But I think you'd get some good red silks, some great green silks, and have an absolutely beautiful 
display with these two. So what do you think? This happy morning winner? Yes? No? And then also, what would you have done with Summer Hill? And again, this is the model. You could also take my greens, whites, and yellow pick and then pick your own reds and blues if you wanted to stitch it out as charter, which might actually be the better course considering how much trouble I had with this. Not all conversions come easy, you know? You can think you know a lot about color and then it'll just remind you that, oh, it's not a fixed point, it's mutable, and it does something different and unexpected all the time. So speaking of color, there are some fabulous new silks in from Avera Swa, and there are, I am thrilled to report, 17 new colors of Swa Surfine. You can order these as a pack from the attic, call them, and give them a call and tell them. And oh my gosh, are these gorgeous or what? I'm gonna have to pick out a high count project to use some of these because Oh, the new brown, these are just fabulous, really missing. It, this is one of my favorite greens, which is now available in Surfine. And then I think these brights are some great sampler or highlight colors. So I'm going to have to pick a chart to make use of these because, oh, this really expands the Surfine range in a way that I'm really excited to play with. Again, you can call the attic. They've got all of these in stock and are willing to sell all the new colors as a pack and a perfect addition to your silk stash because this really fills out the range. So Surfine is derived from the Swa 103 range. So all of these colors come from Swa 103. Surfine is just the much finer thread, more suitable to higher counts. And if you want to know about how the different thread lines interact, the numbering system and characteristics of each, again, I will refer you to the specialty thread tutorial part one, where I explain everything you would want to know about Swasophene, the different thread lines and the numbering system. So one last look. This was my haul for the last two weeks. I have bought absolutely nothing else because mm, new silk colors is like Christmas in my world. So I just went a little nuts and got them all, but I regret nothing. So that's the haul. That's the big news. New silk colors, some really good ones too. Oh, one more look. I know I'm such a silk junkie, but when you see that just luscious, vivid, rich color, how can you not be, right? So that was my haul. And then I am going to announce the giveaway winners from the last episode before I change the camera setup and we look at the very big finish, which is the focus piece for today. So the giveaway from the last time was keyword sparkle and the prize, there are four, they're identical, was a cut of Legacy Linen 38 Count Cloister Cream suitable for working sparkle prim ornaments and then a spool of 103 silk and a really useful green 707 that I've been using on my sparkle prim. So the four winners from last time, number one is Catherine M. Number two, Blenda the Cross Stitcher. Number three, Kathy Gore. And number four, Michelle Hunter. All four winners, I have commented on your comments. Please contact me and send me your mailing address and I will send you your prizes. I hope that you have lots of fun. I hope you experiment with some sparkle prim and I hope that you'll send me photos of what you do with them. So congratulations. And with that, I'm gonna change the camera setup and we're going to look at the very big piece. So now we're going to come for, to the focus piece for today, which is my big stump work mirror. It is the biggest stump work piece I have finished to date and it is a stitching success but a finishing 
Well, I view it as a failure, but I finished with a few issues and we'll discuss that in a minute. But this is the mirror with doors surround available from that was available from Thistle Threads. I won mine in a contest that Trisha held many years ago and decided to work it as a so-called practice piece before beginning my casket. As we had discussed on some of my very first floss tubes, I discovered Cabinet of Curiosities as a baby, baby stitchers stitcher and I was immediately entranced and enthralled at the idea of working a casket. I dove right in and then the magnitude of what I had undertaken hit me and I was just filled with fear that I wouldn't be able to execute the project, that I wouldn't be able to achieve the vision I had for it, and that I would fail at the finishing. Unfortunately, this project did realize some of my fears about finishing. If you're scared about finishing, please don't worry. It is specific to this particular form. If you're working any kind of box or rectangular form, the Simple Harmony tutorials can guide you through it entirely. But what happened here was I did all the stitching, which I consider a success since this theme for today, success and failure. I glued the piece to the backing paper. I was really satisfied. I glued the doors to the backing paper. Again, all good. And then I cut out the surround, which because once you cut out the doors, it's destabilized and has a big hole in the center. The backing paper wrinkled when I was positioning it on the surround. If I had another pair of hands, this could have been avoided, but I didn't know better at the time. So if you're working one of these, please learn from me. Don't do this. And if it were on linen, you wouldn't be able to see it because as you're looking at this, you may think that, that finish looks fine. And for the most part, it does. But silk satin is highly reflective. So, I'm sorry. Anywhere the paper wrinkled, you see lumps and those lumps reflect the light. And how much you see it really depends on the light conditions. So in some positions, it can actually look quite smooth. And then in some conditions, it can look honestly kind of terrible. Unfortunately, the place where I keep this really highlights the issues with the finishing. So I think I dwell on it more than I should. So maybe the idea of success and failure is not so much actual failure, but learning to forgive yourself when you fall short of your own overly high expectations. For the most part, this piece is very beautiful and I'm very proud of it. It is a monster piece of stump work. So I had originally envisioned this, I said, as a practice piece before working my casket. And then that turned into a four year odyssey of all this detached stump work. There are, I think, oh, somewhere in the region of 200 detached pieces on this because Every single petal and leaf and tiny little sepal on this carnation is worked separately as they are for most of the elements on this piece. However, it is best shown in overhead view where I can give you a closer look at it. So we'll switch to that in a second. The theme is Marvell's Mower Poems. So this was inspired by a 17th century original. And unfortunately, I can't show you a photo of that. I, there isn't one on the internet that I'm available of. It had flowers and then the theme was the four continents which we know now there are more than four continents. But back in the 17th century, they thought there were four. So the four continents was a theme sometimes seen in 17th century embroidery. It had animals in each corner representing a continent and then figures under trees and the doors, which I've replicated here. Although my figures are Marvell's mower and his lady love. I was really inspired by the very natural characteristics and the soft colors of the original. And so that's what I chose as my own theme and what to focus on in the design of this piece. So we'll switch to overhead so that we can take a closer look at this piece and its details. 
So this is the full stump work mirror with doors that is my pastoral theme of Marvell's Mower Poems. And we'll talk about some of the details and the working of them here. So this panel is really dominated by high relief detached stump work needle lace, which I went absolutely nuts with. If I can find, I have it written down somewhere just how many pieces there are in this thing. If I can find that, I'll put that in the description. It is a truly eye-popping number. So we will start here with the doors and their two figures. So one of the really interesting things about my inspiration piece, which I am sorry, I can't show you. I could not find a photo on the internet is that it had satin applique for some of the figures, the flowers, and the animals on the original, which is a very rarely seen feature in English 17th century embroidery. So I loved how unusual that was, and I wanted to try doing that on my own piece. So our mower here has a suit of brown silk satin, and then again here on the top rows. It's understitched in swa oval, but the detached pieces on top of it are all in duchess silk satin that I over embroidered. I gave a silk wrapped wire edge and then I applied to the ground fabric to get this beautiful effect. And then the buds here, the rose buds are also made of a silk satin applique. So that was one of the features of the original that really struck me and that I wanted to bring into my own piece. As well as that, why the original inspired me so much is that very unusually for the time, the flowers, the animals, the trees, all the elements, the natural elements on the original mirror were worked in a very natural style. So 17th century English amateur embroidery was usually very exaggerated, very stylized, both in form and in color, yet so many of the elements on the original piece looked like their equivalents in nature. So that was something else that I really wanted to embrace and bring into my own piece. But back to our figures here. So this is the mower. I did all of his little lace collar and cuffs in needle lace, worked with very fine thread. His little laurels in his hand signify his status as poet. His scythe, which is made of gilded paper, is depicts, again, the mower, although, of course, his cavalier costume here is <laughs> quite ridiculous, not really what one wore if you were working in the fields. And then he's under a beautiful gilt tree with silk wrapped pearl leaves. This also has silk wrapped pearl for the tree canopy, but these are worked in simple overlapping loops. This structure is a little more complicated. And then the tree trunk itself is worked and the branches are worked in Ornoué, where you have a gilt or silver passing thread that's couched down with different colors to give color to the gold. And so thrilled with the tree. Of course, having a gold tree did give a balance problem, so I had to bring in lots of gold on the opposing door to make sure that this didn't throw everything totally out of whack. So she has gilt shoes, a gilt underskirt, a gilt drape, and then her tree is worked in gilt silk twist with a gold return underneath it to bring a little sparkle. And then because the tree, although it does have gold in it, is really dominated visually by brown, he's worked entirely by browns and then he's got the darker ground underneath him to try and balance in diagonals these two doors. She has some really interesting features. Her skirt is a very, very fine ornoué. And then I wired the underside edge so that it could be shaped to give these dramatic folds, which are accented visually by the patterns I couched down with silk. And then all of these little trims on her dress were worked separately as needle lace pieces and then attached. And then I also did some beadwork here for her. So as I was finishing this figure, I was getting more and more into 
beads and beading as you saw on my big beaded basket. So I decided to bring a little bit of that into here and I made beaded leaves here. So the lighter green leaves are beads and then flowers as well as the flower on her head and her little crown of leaves. So those are the doors. And then the insects, which fill out all the gaps between the flowers and the surround were something else that I had a great time with. They, all, most of them have gold accents to try and connect the surround to the doors as a design feature. So this guy right here is a butterfly with very, very fine needle lace wings and then a gilt stretched pearl body. And then this snail. I had so much fun with this snail. There's a photo of my earlier version of this on my Instagram last week, if you're on Instagram and you saw it. So I envisioned a snail with this really big ludicrous gold shell to kind of, well, you can see given the way the ground dips that there's bigger visual space here that needed to be filled. So that big ridiculous shell is what I chose to fill it. And then right next to him, there's a bug with tiny gilt needle lace leaves. They're edged with a thread called miliary. And he's perched on the leaves of the iris. So the iris is all detached needle lace. And then I love the upper petals it's got those lovely scallops that you see on some irises and then after I did the needle lace I over embroidered it to get the veining pattern for those upper leaves and then the biggest floral elements are found in the center of each side we'll start with the thistles which are really marked by the greenery so one way of getting a good vertically composed design is to get progressively darker as you move down the piece. So you've got the lightest element right here at the center top and then the darkest one at the bottom which grounds your composition. So this is worked in darker greens and the flower is dominated by its greenery. So there's understitched leaves and then there's detached and shaped leaves here. I think there are 11 separate needle lace elements just on this one piece alone. All of course, although the most needle lace is seen on the two side elements. Sweet William here, so the leaves are gilt silk twist, as are the leaves on the carnation, but the real star I think are all those petals on the carnation which were worked separately. There is some understitching here which you can see um, underneath the petals. That was mostly because all the wires poking out of the back of this thing need to put, needed a place to go and having some silk there helped keep the ground fabric from tearing and gave me an easy place to kind of hide those wires and a place for them to kind of sink into and be absorbed so it wouldn't be too much of a problem in finishing. So all of those are worked separately and then they can be shaped or folded as seen there and that was just this was actually one of the first things that I did on this mirror and oh this flower taught me about the joys of needle lace because there was just nothing like seeing this grow petal by petal and become this fully realized motif so as you can see, the mirror is dominated visually by green, pink, and yellow, which is kind of my trinity of colors, although you do see some blue here with the ladies. So I tried to stick to a really limited color palette to keep all of these elements cohesive. And this, I would say, was my first really big original design and execution. I think it turned out quite well in terms of the stitching, although of course the finishing, oh, it's there if you're looking for it, but since I am the person who made the mistake, so like again there at the side you can see it, and because where it lives in my house it gets 
just reflects a lot of light and I can see the wrinkling in the ground paper. But again, that's something specific to this style of piece. So if you're working simple harmony, if you're working casket, don't be worried. It's just the problem of applying the unsupported surround to this piece that caused the problems here. So this is my stump work mirror showing Marvell's mower and his lady love. The doors do open, by the way, to reveal a lovely mar green marbled paper on the inside of the doors and then a mirror inside them. Although I never do open this because, oh, the doors, the trees, this entire piece was just, a joy to work even if at some point I thought it was going to drive me stark raving mad and it did really cement my love for needle lace. I had done a little bit of stump work before this but after getting through this giant piece I really did feel like a master at it. I hope you enjoyed the look at my stump work mirror. It really was <laughs> quite a project but a very fulfilling one. This is really where I fell in love with needle lace. And then again if you are enjoying the stump work features on my floss tube we will be looking again at my Britomart casket on the next floss tube in two weeks. I have been stitching on it. I've made some good progress that I can't wait to share with you but I wanted all the focus today to be on my mirror so we will save that for next time when I hope to show you lots of progress on Britomart as well as progress on my other whips. Santa stops here, Modern Folk Embroideries, Home Sweet Home, and then we'll see if I have any wild card starts to throw in there with it. So I'll see you again in two weeks, and until then, happy stitching.